one time when Ajahn Sawat was here. He asked me to give the Dharma talk in Thai. And I've been translating Ajahn Lee, and so I used one of Ajahn Lee's images. Comparing the practice to digging a well. Generosity was like a very shallow well. Virtue, a deeper well. Whereas concentration was a really deep well. And afterwards he told me that the Dharma talk was too interesting. It was distracting people from their meditation. So, don't listen to me. Focus on your breath. The talk is here in the background to catch you if you wander away from the breath. Kind of like the catcher in the rye. I'm here standing at the edge of the cliff. In case those of you were running around in the rye are really looking at what you're doing and you run away and you're heading off to the edge of the cliff. I'm here to catch you. Make sure you don't fall away from your meditation object. Or you can think of this as a fence. You start leaving the meditation object, the first thing you'll run into is the sound of the talk. That's to remind you to go back. The word desana, or the, the word we usually translate as sermon or dharma talk, actually means pointing. And the talk is here to point you back to the breath, point you back to your present awareness. Make sure you don't go wandering off. You're trying to be one with your meditation. There are two words with one in the Buddhist descriptions of jhana. One is ekata ramana. Oneness of preoccupation or singleness of preoccupation. or egakata citta, singleness of mind. In other words, you want to be focused on one thing, like the breath. And you want to make that one thing the one thing that fills the range of your awareness. So you start out trying to do that. There's the mind aware of the breath, evaluating the breath, commenting on the breath. And you want to get more and more that the one topic of your conversation inside is the breath. And as far as other things that have been going on in the course of the day, you don't want to talk about them. Don't go slipping off into the past, slipping off into the future, wondering about what you're going to do tomorrow, what you're going to do at the end of the meditation, or how much longer you have to meditate here. That's introducing other topics of conversation. And the mind never really settles down. So just keep the topic of conversation on one thing, on the breath. And evaluate how it's going. Where, What kind of breath would you like to breathe right now? You're perfectly free. You may not be able to think about other things right now. That's off the agenda. But when you have the breath on the agenda totally, then you're totally free to explore it. What kind of breathing would really feel good right now in your stomach? So breathe that way. Focus on your stomach for a while and see what kind of breathing really feels good in the stomach. What kind of breathing feels good going down your backbone? What kind of breathing feels good in your legs? You may not be able to breathe with your legs, but there is a breath energy that can flow down through the legs. What kind of rhythm of breathing keeps that breath energy live? Awake. And John Lee talks about waking up the different properties of your body. And this is what he means, is having a sense that there is an energy that flows through your legs, flows through your arms, all around your head, all the different parts of your body, out to the fingers and toes. There's even an energy, if you're really sensitive, that kind of surrounds your body. Can you be sensitive to that? And what kind of breathing? makes those different parts of the body feel good. Just go through the body and think of that 
You're breathing specifically for your stomach for a while. So what kind of breathing feels good in your stomach? What kind of breathing feels good in your shoulders, in the backs of your shoulders, in your hips, in your toes, in your eyes? That last one is especially good for moving on to the next stage. Once you've been evaluating the breath, and you finally get it, so it really feels good, breathing in, breathing out. There comes a point where you don't have to evaluate it anymore. As a John Fuhr once said, there's, you fill up the breath energy in the body, it's like filling up water into a jar. And then there comes a point with a jar of water, and we're talking about those big jars they have, or they used to have in houses in Thailand, that would catch rainwater off the roof. Enormous jars, sometimes bigger than a person. And after all, the jar is so full of water that no matter how much more water you pour into it, it can't keep anymore. It's the same with the breath. It gets to a point where the breath energy feels full throughout the body. The legs feel full, the arms feel full, in other words, they feel awake. And you don't need to do any more evaluation. That's why you just dive into the breath. This is the other word for oneness in the descriptions of jhana. Ego di pawa means unification. In other words, your awareness and the breath become one. You don't hold anything back. That sense of the observer, which is sometimes like a like an animal perched on your shoulders, looking through your eyes, looking at the breath in the different parts of the body. You want to obliterate the sense that that observer is separate from the breath, so you breathe into the observer. This is why thinking of breath energy in your eyes helps to create the sense of being one. The awareness is one with the breath, the breath is one with the awareness. And then just try to maintain that. Any thought that deviates from that, that spills out from that, you don't want. Totally throw yourself into the breath. And there's nothing else you have to do, nowhere else you have to go. And John Lee makes the comment that this breath that you're totally thrown into, that will take you through all the levels of jhana, up to the fourth. The sense of being one with the breath. It's simply a question of how steady you are in staying one with the breath. It takes some energy to do this. You've got to throw your, all your energy into being with the breath. But you'll find that by giving all your energy, you get a lot of energy back. That's when everything in the body is really awake, because your sense of awareness permeates every cell. This is when your preoccupation or the object of your meditation really does become one, in the sense not only that it's the one thing you're talking about, you're not talking about it much anymore, you're just in with it. And it fills the whole range of your awareness. When you do this, you find that any movement of metal chatter in the mind becomes very obvious. And again, you just drop it, drop it, drop it. Yeah. Nope, this is not the time for that. You've got something better going on here. The mind is snug with the breath, like a hand inside a glove, totally surrounded. The breath has you surrounded on all sides. Again, it's, you're not pulling back to watch it from outside, you're totally immersed in it. To use a phrase from the Pali, the mind, your mindfulness is immersed in the body here. Your awareness is totally surrounded by the breath, totally surrounded by the body. And once you can do that, just try to maintain that in a very balanced state. And part of the 
mind might object, this is stupid, you're not thinking about anything. But precisely the point, you don't have to think about anything. The, the mind needs this to rest, to gain energy. And John Lee compares this to putting a knife in a scabbard. You want to make sure that your knife is sharp when you need it, so you have to protect it. Put it in something that keeps it snug, keeps it protected on all sides. When the time comes you really need to cut something, maybe you take it out of the scabbard. But in the meantime, you've got to keep your mind well protected, well energized. This is when the mind really enters into right concentration in a very strong and solid way. And this is the heart of the path. The other factors will come out of this and surround this and, as the Buddha says, support this. But it's this oneness of the mind with its object. This is the center from which everything else happens. And John Lee talks about this as taking all four frames of reference, the body in and of itself, feelings in and of themselves, mind in and of itself, mental qualities in and of themselves. This is the point where they all become one. I mean, you could look at this as that's one aspect that's body, there's another aspect that's feeling, there's an aspect that's mind, and there's an aspect that's mental qualities, but they're all here in the same place. If you want to see the distinctions among them, you have to bring them together first. So that when they finally do separate out, it's not because you tried to chip them out. The analogy he gives is of melting a piece of rock that has different kinds of ore. You melt it to a certain temperature and the, the silver melts out. Another temperature, the gold will melt out. Another temperature, the, the tin will melt out. of their own accord. In other words, you're not dividing things up in terms of your preconceived notions. Just when you put the energy of this oneness into the breath, make everything one. That's when things are allowed to separate in a natural way in ways that you may not have expected. But in the meantime, try to make them one. Try to get really good at this. This is one of the essential skills in the meditation. And as for the insight that will arise from this, you don't have to worry about it. Make sure you've got, at least not yet, make sure you've got the foundation really solid.